can turn it to Philippians chapter 4 for the lesson tonight. Every relationship that would be successful is based upon good communication. I think we all would agree with that. You think about every relationship that you know of, if it would be successful, it would be based upon the healthy communication between the parties involved. And so a strong marriage will have good communication between a husband and a wife. If there's a good parent-child relationship, it is a relationship where the parents feel comfortable and realize that they can speak to their children in such a way that they'll be heard and obeyed and listened to. And likewise, the children can come to the parents and communicate with them. Companies that are successful, where their co-workers working side by side, it is normally to the degree that they have and enjoy successful and healthy communication. And it's no different with us and God, our relationship toward our Heavenly Father. If we would have the kind of relationship that will be rich and thriving and balanced, it's to the degree that our communication is what it should be. Now, communication, as you know, is a two-way street, and so God communicates with us through his word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. He fully furnishes us for every good work through the Bible, and there'll be a lot of lessons about that this week at the lectureship, but the way that we communicate with God is through prayer. And so if we don't learn how to pray, if we don't pray the way that God wants us to, we run the risk of having an imbalanced or a lopsided relationship with God, and it's going to hamper our communication. And once the communication is compromised, so then will be the relationship. And so we need to have a strong relationship of prayer. You know, prayer started, at least the first time I see it in the Bible, is Genesis 4, 26. It says, then men began, began to call on the name of the Lord. And from that moment up to the present hour, men and women have been communicating with God through prayer. You read in the Old Testament of prayers from men like Hezekiah and David and Solomon and Abraham and Moses and women like Hannah, and you come over to the New Testament, and we read of Paul and Silas praying, and their prayers by Jesus and so many other individuals, and then they write to us over and over again telling us to pray. But for all of the information in the Bible with prayer, if we're honest, sometimes we still are prayerfully tongue-tied when it comes to praying toward God. Very few of us would say, I'm an expert in prayer. I know how it works. I know how it's done, and I do it right, and we're in good company. The disciples came to Jesus in Luke 11 and verse 1. They said, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples, and immediately after people were baptized in the first century, they continued steadfastly in prayer, Acts 2.42. Now, I believe that involves the disciples praying, the apostles praying, but maybe even teaching these new Christians how to approach God in prayer. Tonight, what I want to do is to be very simple. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is going to be our passage tonight and walk through what are some of the basics from this passage that we learn about prayer. What are some of the things that will hopefully launch us into this new week beginning tonight that will help us to reach up to God better? If I confuse you at all tonight, I failed you or you failed you if you haven't paid attention. But the goal tonight is to be very simple and raise to the surface, I believe, five things that this passage teaches us about prayer, things that we can and need to practice so that our relationship with God and our communication with him can be what he wants it to be. And so let's begin Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Number one, prayer is to be done in everything. If you look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, the verse before the one we just had read and quoted, Paul says, let your moderation or your reasonableness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I believe this is twofold. The fact that God is near is a word of warning, but it's also a word of comfort. God's close to you. And because of that, be careful for nothing but in everything. That idea, of, that, the idea there is in every circumstance. Let your, pr your prayer and request be made known to God because God wants to hear from us. Philippians 4 and verse 6 says about prayer, in every circumstance, it's right to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 goes along with these verses. In everything or in every circumstance, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Paul is saying pray instead of worrying. I know it's a lot easier to worry about everything and pray about nothing, but Paul says, how about trying that the other way around? Worry about nothing. Pray in every circumstance about everything. You can always go to God in prayer. This is more than just preaching material from Paul. The Philippians would know that Paul practiced what he preached. When he went to Philippi in Acts 16, you remember Paul and Silas are beaten and placed in the stocks. And Acts 16, 25 says that they spent that night praying and singing praises to God, which eventually leads to the conversion of the Philippian jailers. And so when Paul says, pray in everything, Paul is saying to the Philippians, practice what I did among you 
and pray to God in every circumstance. Don't let worry overwhelm you. Pray all the time is what Paul is driving at. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Paul says pray in everything. One man said, we learn how to pray by praying. There's always more that we can do after we have prayed, but there's not a lot that we can do before we pray. We start with prayer. No wonder Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1, above all things, first of all, be an individual that prays. In every circumstance, we should be people that are praying. When you look at the life of Jesus, it's interesting to note not only that Jesus prayed, but the different places and the different times that Jesus often found himself praying. He prayed when he came up out of the waters after he was baptized in Luke chapter 3 and verse 21. He rose up early in the morning, Mark 135, and got off to a silent place, and there he prayed. Jesus prayed after he fed the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6. He prayed in public, Matthew 11, 25 through 27. If we would walk in the footsteps of Jesus, it's going to be to this degree that you and I learn how to pray in every circumstance. Nobody will come to the end of their life and say, I sure wasted time praying about that, or I wish I didn't pray about this. What we will probably assume is, I wish I prayed more. Sometimes somebody says to me, do you think I'm bothering God? Because I keep praying about this same thing, this same situation, this same person. I believe based on what I see in Scripture, we never bug God when we pray for things consistently with his will, no matter how many times we pray for him. But it may be the other way around. It just may be the case that we bug him when we don't pray. Maybe God looks down at us and he says, why do they think they can do it without me? And why does she think it's too late to pray about that? And why didn't he come to me first? And why did he rush through our time together just so briefly? And why aren't they talking to me more? Why aren't they bringing those things to me? Why do they only come to me with the big stuff? Don't they know for them it's all big stuff? Pray in everything, every circumstance. You need my help. In Luke 18 and verse 1, Jesus taught a parable that men ought always to pray and never to lose heart. He talked about a widow in a city and a judge, and you know how the parable goes where Jesus says this judge was pestered by this widow, but eventually he gives in and he says, how much more should God's children cry to him? He wants to hear from us. Some of the circumstances that we should pray in are these. Now, this list isn't exhaustive, but we should be praying when we're afraid. Psalm 56 and verse 3, the psalmist says, When I am afraid, my trust and my prayer is in thee. We should pray when we're tempted. Matthew 6, 13, pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. We should pray when we need wisdom. James 1 and verse 5, James says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men freely and without reproach. We should pray before big decisions. It doesn't matter what the decision is. Luke 6 and verse 12, before Jesus selected the apostles, we're told he spent all night in prayer to God. And then the next morning, he made one of the biggest decisions he would ever make. These men would be the foundation for the church, and they would preach the gospel. We should pray when we have sinned. We should pray about evangelism. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 1, Paul said, pray that the word of the Lord has free course. Pray when we're sick and in need of healing. Pray when we're overwhelmed. Do you ever feel overwhelmed? David did. And this is what he said in Psalm 61 and verse 2. When my heart is overwhelmed, I pray to God, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. There is somebody in heaven that can deal with the things that overwhelm us that we can't. Pray when we're at a total loss. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12 King Jehoshaphat prayed, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Sometimes you just don't know what to pray, and that's a good time to pray. But what about these? Pray when we're happy, pray in suffering. Psalm 42 in verse 8 says, when I'm in suffering and hardship, I will make my prayer to the God of my life. You could make 13 lists longer than this one in everything. We should be praying. Have you thought about what a blank check prayer is? Paul says, pray in every circumstance. Think about all of the passages that you know that say, as long as I'm praying within the parameters of God's will, God wants to hear from me. If we ask anything according to his will, 1 John 5, 14, he hears us. We have boldness and access, Ephesians 3 and verse 12. We can boldly come into the throne of grace to find help and mercy in the time of need. What are we carrying tonight that we should be praying about, that we should be laying at the feet of God? I want to encourage us to pray in every circumstance. One of the basic principles about prayer is this. It's always a good time to pray. Anthony Ash in his book on prayer said, imagine a man that was a Muslim converting to Christianity. He learned the gospel. Jesus is more than the prophet. He's the son of God. And imagine you start teaching this man, look, you're no longer back to the five times a day in a certain posture that you were taught in Islam. Now you can pray to God whenever you want. And then imagine he follows you around and me around. Would he pray less or more? 
it's hard to imagine that someone would become a Christian and pray less than they did before. But what if they watched us? Paul says, in every circumstance, it's always the right time to pray. Number two, from Philippians 4, Paul says, there are different types of prayers. Did you know that there are varieties when we talk about prayer? I know we say, well, just pray, but there are different types. Look at Philippians 4 and verse 6 and notice, Paul says, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, and then he also mentions requests. Sometimes commentators say, well, don't make a big deal about those words. They all are interchangeable and overlapping. But I believe Paul used the different words by inspiration of the Holy Spirit on purpose. He's trying to say that we do approach God through prayer, but there are different needs and different requests, and our prayer shouldn't always be of the same flavor. Now, here are the different types. Paul says, in everything by prayer. That's just your general word for request. That's just general prayer. That's approaching God, asking for the things we need. But then supplication, that's an urgent request to meet a need. Sometimes there's an urgent request. We make announcements from this pulpit saying, so-and-so's in surgery, or this person has cancer, and we are offering up supplication to God on behalf of an individual. Sometimes it's Thanksgiving. More about that later on, but Thanksgiving. Our prayers need to be such that they are offering up thanks to God. There's requests, things that we ask for, 1 John 5, 15. And then Paul, in a similar list, and you might write this out on the side of the margin, Philippians 4, 6, right next to it, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. Paul uses an identical list to this one. The only thing he adds in that list is intercession. So Paul says, Timothy, first of all, I would that supplications, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. There are different types of prayers. You know what that means about your prayer life and mine? First tonight, basic prayer principle. Pray in every circumstance. But then number two, we should be praying different types, different kinds. Paul says there are different kinds, and you and I should be offering up different types of prayers to God because there are different situations that call for it. What is your prayer? I guess all of us kind of have one. If people in your family and you're the man and you pray over the food, maybe people know at night when you pray in the family, you just have your prayer. You start the same way. You kind of end the same way. If you drop dead in the middle of the prayer, somebody could just pick up, you know. They know what you're going to say. Maybe you have your prayer. May I challenge you tonight to think about what Paul says Think through. No, this requires us to become deeper people. Sometimes the shallowness in our prayers is because we're just not deep enough. We haven't gotten in tune with the people in our lives and the hardships they're suffering, or we're not as aware in our world about all the things that are going on. And so when we bow our heads before God, we just kind of jump into our regular routine. Paul says, stop it and just think for a minute. There are times to come to prayer, request, supplication, giving of thanks, intercession, there are different times and they're different. And this is what makes sense because there are graduations and funerals and weddings and hospital visits and there's people on hospice. And you wouldn't approach all of those circumstances identically. You go through the same avenue of prayer, but you would approach it as the situation called for. And so we need to diversify our prayers. Paul says, one thing to learn about prayer is there are different kinds. Now, somebody's going to correct me about this after the sermon, but I looked it up, and this is what I found. In 1980, there were only 10 channels on most TVs. Maybe there were more, maybe there were less. I'll meet you at the door after, and you can tell me. But I'm told there were only 10 channels. That's all you had. wasn't a lot of variety. There wasn't really much to watch. You just had those 10 channels. And maybe sometimes we do prayer like that, but we're not, are we? Cast all your cares and anxieties on God because he cares for you. Do you have people in your life that when they come up on the caller ID, maybe this person calls you, maybe this person texts you, and you just know that this person is, for lack of better words, this person's a user. They don't really ever call it. When you see the number, you just start running through the list. This person needs money. They need a ride. They need a babysitter. I mean, they need something because this person would never just call me to call me. This person's only in one vein with me. They don't talk to me about other things. Does God see us that way? This person really only has one prayer channel. Whenever I see Hiram's name come up on the heavenly caller ID, the only thing, he, he just wants something. That's the only time he prays to me. He's, only, he's got a one-track mind with me. Does God say that about you? Does God say that about me? We should have a broader scope of prayer. We should be individuals that pray in different situations because different situations call for it. We should come to God when we're sad. We should come to God when we're happy. But offer up these different types of prayer. Maybe you're somebody that always praises God in prayer. That's great. But it's good to request things too. 
James 1.17 says that God as a heavenly father gives us good gifts. Don't just praise. You need to petition God for what you need. It's part of his job and his delight as a heavenly father to give you blessings. Maybe you're somebody who always comes to God with supplication, always requesting, requesting, requesting. That's great, too. There are times for that. But I encourage you to go to God just because he's God. Psalm 63 in verse 1, I'm seeking you early in the morning. Go to God for that. Or maybe you're somebody, you find yourself always and only praying for yourself. And there's a time to do that. Oh, try some intercession. Do you realize tonight that there are some people that can't pray for themselves? Christians, we can intercede. We can be the go-between. We can offer up prayers on behalf of God. We get a two-fold blessing. Not only would it help them, but it would help us draw nearer to God, and we need that. And so in our prayers, offer up variety. Don't pray the same way, the same time, all the time. Paul says there's prayer, request, supplication, thanksgiving. We've got to diversify what we offer up to God because God says these are the various avenues through which I'm approached. I realize that in one prayer, all of those things can be offered up. That's true. But maybe sometimes we get stuck in a rut. And number two tonight is there's variety concern in prayer. Now, here's number three. Number three says that when we pray to God, we should have appreciation. Let your request be made with thanksgiving. That's what Paul says. And everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. God wants to hear from us in prayer, but we need to code every one of our prayers with this aspect of thanksgiving. There are actually people that come to God, get what they want, and they never turn around, and they never say thank you. It's always about what they need. It's always about what they're going to receive from God, but they never stop and pause to say, thank you, God. True biblical prayer is always saturated with thanksgiving for what we already have before God ever grants a request, or even if God denies a request. In everything, there always should be and must be thanksgiving. In Ephesians 5, in verse 20, Paul says, giving thanks always unto God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that describe your prayer life? Does it describe mine? Always in all things, God can count on you and me to be thankful people. You know, this is a matter of the heart. These two guys, they wrote a book called Cat and Dog Prayer, and they start off in the first few pages, and what they talk about in the book is this idea that every one of us has a cat and dog theology, every one of us. They say the dog lives to please his master. The dog says, you feed me, you give me shelter, you pet me, you must be God. The cat, on the other hand, says, hey, you feed me, you clothe me, you pet me, I must be God. And maybe if you have dogs and cats, you know what that's like, but the bottom line is, are you a cat or a dog? Do you think that God does all of this stuff for you just because you're you and that you deserve it? Or are we people that realize You know, God really doesn't owe me anything, and every time I pray, it's going to be coated with thanksgiving. We normally say thank you when we've received things. This is not all that Paul's talking about here. Paul has more in mind than just the spirit of thanksgiving that should just ooze from us as God's children. It's what Job had in Job 121. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. It's what the apostles had when they were beaten in the first century. In Acts 5 and verse 41, they walked away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. In every circumstance, they were in that said, thank you to God. If we're going to be the people that pray to God in a way that's acceptable to him, it's to the degree that we learn how to cultivate the spirit of thanksgiving. No wonder Paul could pray. Even after God denied removing the thorn in the flesh, Paul could pray and say, his grace is sufficient for me. His strength is made perfect in my weakness And Paul was content with that. Are you the thankful kind of person? Are we the people that go to God habitually and say, thank you for what you've already done, and whatever you do in the future is fine with me? Then there's peace received, number four. When we pray to God, Paul promises that we'll receive peace. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is the idea that the peace of God stands guard before the Christian. As we offer up prayers to God in every circumstance, as we offer up various types of prayers, supplication, request, thanksgiving, intercession, as we code all of our prayers with thanksgiving, Paul says God gives us something, not only the answer to our prayers, but also the peace that we need. We lay our cares at the feet of God, and God lays his peace in our hearts. It's a great isn't it? Paul says you can have it. Pray to God and receive peace. 
The thing about biblical peace is this. It does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that your problems and mine will necessarily be removed. In fact, most times after we've prayed, when our heads are raised and our eyes are open, not much has changed out here, but everything's changed up there. The child of God can have peace in prayer because we accept this great reality. I prayed about it. God knows about it. God's working on it. Let's look at this poem from Elizabeth Hickok. At least this is a part of the stanza. I think she captures this idea right. She says, I know not if the blessing sought will come in just the way I thought, but leave my prayer with him alone, whose will is wiser than my own, assured that he will grant my quest or send me some answer far more blessed. You see, that's the peace of God which surpasses all understanding that says God knows what's best. God's going to work it out. Maybe our problem and why we stay up at night wrestling back and forth with things is we just haven't prayed. Maybe we've prayed to God, but we don't really believe that God's involved and that God's going to make a difference. David said in Psalm 55 and verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will not suffer the righteous to be moved. When the priests were blessed by Moses in number six and verse 26, he said, may the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God wants to give you peace, but you've got Leave it. God wants peace, but we have to be individuals that open up our hearts. God, give me peace. I've prayed to you about things. I'm going to leave things with you. Somebody said, if you're going to worry, don't pray. If you're going to pray, don't worry. And I know that's easier said than done, and yet it must be done. We've got to pray to God and then trust that God's working on it and let God be God and leave the worrying to people without a heavenly father. If God is really watching over us and God cares about us and God's opened up this avenue of communication with us to the degree that we reach up to him in prayer, we will know his peace. Here's the last one tonight. Prayer is to be directed to God. I told you we were going basic tonight, and Paul says pray in every circumstance. He says there are different types. There are different varieties of prayer. There's supplication, request, thanksgiving, intercession. Do it always with thanksgiving. Receive God's peace, but notice in verse 6, let your requests be made known unto God. We are in a position that few people in the world have ever been in. I mean, if you go back to the Old Testament, people could pray to God, but people that worshiped idols, they didn't know they had this blessing. They didn't know that they could reach up to the Heavenly Father. And even in the Old Testament, people offered up sacrifices through those Old Testament priests. But now in Christ, we have a relationship and we're on speaking terms with God in a way that people have never known before Christ. We cry out, have a father, Galatians 4 and verse 6. We can speak to God in a special way. Our prayers are made in the name of Jesus. That's not just the way we sign off our prayers. When Jesus says, pray in my name, John 14, 13 and 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will hear you that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That means more than just saying that phrase. It means to pray in line with the will of God. And we go through the authority of Jesus Christ. When we come to God through prayer, we don't come alone. We come with Jesus, and it is through his name and based on his authority we pray, and we can make our request known unto God. Do we know who it is that we really are praying to? Paul says, let your request be made known unto God. You know, it's great. It's great to be able to be in such a way. Maybe you have a prayer chair. We talk about prayer closets. There's nothing wrong with any of those things as long as they have wheels on them, right? Because you're going to be in different circumstances, and you'll find yourself in different situations where if you're just waiting to get to this special place, if you're just waiting until you get to this special room, you're never going to pray. But we can let our prayer be made known unto God. And the omnipresent God who's in various places at various times, God will hear us pray. We're praying to the one who said, is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32 and verse 27. To you that answers prayers, all from Psalm 65 and verse let your request be made known to God. We often talk about our problems and bellyache about our problems, write in diaries about problems, but do we take it to God? Paul says, let your request be made known unto God, and God will hear it, and God will work on it. God will answer, God will intercede, and God will save. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is a basic text about prayer. Paul says some things that, really can get us going, get us off the ground as we learn how to communicate with God in every circumstance and every time, all from different types of prayer, praying to God through Jesus Christ, all the while being thankful. Not everybody in the world can pray, but Christians can always pray. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12 says that God's eyes are over the righteous and his ears 
are open to our prayers. It's amazing that God hears prayers, but more than that, that God wants to hear prayers. His ears are open every time we pray. God, you've got my undivided attention. What is it that you need? How can I help you? How can I be of an aid to you? And we should avail ourselves to prayer far more than we often do and with far more confidence and faith than maybe we have in the past. Tonight, maybe somebody needs to obey the gospel. The truth is, until you do this, until you become a Christian, you're really not on speaking terms with God. We're not saved through a prayer, but we are saved so that we then can pray and reach up to God. When the Bible says that sinners ought to call on the name of the Lord, it has absolutely nothing to do with prayer and everything to do with believing in Jesus, turning from sin, and calling on him as we confess his name and are baptized so that our sins can be washed away. Acts 2.21, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the people that did that in Acts 2 were the people that repented of their sins and were immersed for the forgiveness of those sins. Maybe somebody needs to do that tonight. Maybe there's somebody here tonight who needs the prayers of the church. On that list we had up earlier about the various circumstances, one of those passages in James 5 says, there's a time to call for the elders of the church and have them to pray. And if you need the prayers of the church tonight, our elders will be down here waiting and willing to pray on your behalf. If we can help you in any way, come now as we stand and as we sing.